without uh, further ado, I, I will uh, um, invite uh, Luis Gustavo Pereira, uh, uh, from Vice Director from uh, Universidade Católica Portuguesa, and a, a member, a colleague from the, the organizing the program committee of this event, to share the, the next uh, the next session. Please, uh, Luis. Thank you so much, Eli. Good morning uh, to everyone. Bons dias, buenos dias. So it's my honor to present uh, Professor Rian Lechert, uh, born in 76. She studied Dutch law and international law at Tilburg University, the University of Amsterdam and the University of Montpellier and received her PhD in 2005. Her research focuses on the impact of international tribunals on societies and people who are confronted with serious violations of human rights and international crimes. Since the 1st of September 2016, Professor Letcher is Rector Magnificus of Maastricht University. She is a member of the Supervisory Board of uh, Katharina Hospital Eindhoven and the uh, Bonn Fountain Museum uh, Maastricht. She is a member of the Board of Trustees of Redress the Netherlands. In 2019, she was awarded the title Top Woman of the Year in the Netherlands. So, Professor Rian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, colleague rectors. It's an honor for me to, to, to be here, actually in my own house, uh, looking at a screen. Uh, it would have been, honestly, so much nicer uh, if we could have been uh, in an audience like you showed in the movie, movie when we started uh, the seminar. But we all know why that is not possible. So we'll do our best uh, to have as much as possible an interactive seminar where you will also be able to post your questions through the chat or later by approaching me uh, through email because that is what I think is always so valuable if you go to a conference and you actually meet people also during coffees and receptions. Now I'm very pleased that I get the opportunity today to talk to you about a program that we are carrying out together with the 14 Dutch universities. So like you are also part of a consortia of universities, also the Dutch universities are united in what we call uh, the Association of Dutch Universities and in Dutch that is VSNU, as you see in the, in, the, in the first slide. And I think that is very important to say that I'm not here as rector of Maastricht University, but I'm representing the 40 universities, which makes also our program much stronger and also the uh, ambitions that we are trying to achieve together. Um, next slide, please. Now, what we have done with these 14 universities is to launch what we call a position paper. And you see on this slide the first, like the cover of the paper that you can also find online on the website of the Dutch Association of Universities, also in English available. And it's called Room for Everyone's Talent. And it's a position paper that we not only wrote together with the Dutch universities, but also with the public knowledge institutions and funders of research, also the Royal Academy was part of it, the Association of the Medical Hospitals, and also our national funding organizations of research, which is very important because as you will uh, realize later in my presentation, the whole ecosystem in the knowledge infrastructure should work together in order to be able to realize our ambitions. Now, what I will try to do in the presentation is to explain to you what the secret is of the Dutch approach, but we're not there yet eh? because we started with this position paper and uh, of course that's not enough because what we need is a fundamental change in the way that we recognize and reward our academic staff. And that's also the title of the national program, recognition and rewards. Now, why do we need a change? We need a change, next slide please, because we would like to see that our academic work continues to be connected to society and that also the general public continues to value and support our work as universities. We also want to make the best use of all of the different talents that we have 
within our universities. And I'll explain to you later what these different talents look like. And lastly, but definitely not least, we want to ensure that our organizations are healthy work environments where current and future generations will want to work. And I cannot uh, relate uh, to the situation in your own countries, but in our country, the number of surveys showing the increasing levels of work pressure is enormous. And also the frustrations from our staff that complain about all the different demands that are put on them and the little career prospects that they have. Next slide, please. What we see in our current Dutch way of assessing our academic staff is that there is a big gap in what we reward and what we actually aim for. Now, what we tend to reward is very much related to the activities and achievements in the research domain. And there we focus also very much on the output. And that means that we quantitatively assess the number of publications and the number of grants. And if you're good in that, then there is a possibility to grow in your career ultimately to what we call in our system full professor. Whereas we also know that our staff is doing so much more. They teach, they try to have impacts with their research on society, whether it's societal or in an economic way. They have various leadership roles that they need to undertake. But when we yearly assess their achievements, we tend to focus again on this research domain. So what would we like to see changed? Next slide, please. We would like to see very much a diversification of career tracks and being able to focus on the different talents that our academics have and being able to excel also in other domains than only the domain of research. Now, this is a picture that we use in the position paper. You see happy faces. That's of course also what we would really like to see that we go from work pressure to work pleasure and that the uh, academics also have a choice to say, I would focus in my career more on innovation of education, or I am gifted in creating impacts uh, with regard to my research, and I want to focus a little bit more on that, and build a career also around these tracks, instead of, as I said, um, uh, focusing on research only, and wanting everyone to excel in all these but in the end, only rewarding what you do in research. And in Dutch, we have a saying that we, we, we tend to think that all our academics are like sheep with five feet, as if they are gifted in all these different domains. And you see on the picture here, you see education, research, impact, and leadership. And you also see patient care on the other side of the slide. Because also patient care is for many of our academic staff working in the academic hospitals, of course, also a crucial part of their tasks. And also from the uh, staff working in these medical hospitals, we continuously hear that the pressure on them to excel in all these domains is enormous and that they would like to see a change also uh, with regards to the way that they conduct their work. Now, what do we want to change? I will make it more concrete. Next slide, please. And then right to the next. First of all, we aim, and this is what we have stated, and I think that's important to uh, uh, emphasize here again, with the 14 universities, we have stated that we are working towards this ambition. And so it's no longer a vision that needs to be supported by the universities. No, we've already committed ourselves to this ambition. So what are we going to do? We will enable the diversification and digitalization of career paths thereby promoting excellence in each of the key areas, but not having to be excellent in all of these domains. So we are going to stimulate educational career paths, and we are going to create assessment uh, criteria and assessment frames in order to be able to assess in what way someone can become full professor in the educational track, while still doing research, because we're a university where we would like to see the combination of research and education, but if you are a talented teacher, an innovator in your teaching, 
someone who has national impact with its education, a leader, so to speak, in education, and you should be able to grow in your career. And the same is with regard to leadership, and I want to emphasize that here as well. We take for granted that our academic staff, in particular once you are associate or full professor, also become leaders of big groups, institutes, departments, at some point even dean, or in my case, becoming a rector. And we tend to uh, underestimate the necessity to also guide people in the development to become an academic leader and to also know what it takes. And also to, that doesn't sound maybe too nice, but also to deselect if you're not such a good leader. And I think we all have examples of leaders in institutes and departments that should actually not have that role, but should focus on their research and education in which they are very gifted. So also the whole domain of leadership is something that the Dutch universities have said we should take that much more serious provide development paths there and also being honest if you're not a gifted leader and there's also no potential for development in that area. That doesn't make you a loser, but it just makes you someone who should do something else in these various domains that we have. Second, please. Um, normally I can see in the audience if everyone is with me. That's impossible now, so I just hope that I'm not going too fast or uh, that you can easily understand what I'm saying. I Seven, we also would like to provide a better balance between the individual achievements of our staff members and what they contribute to the team. As we all know, um, many of the efforts and achievements that we have are part of teamwork. And we very much, very much would like to also recognize and reward the contributions that our staff make to wider, larger objectives than only your own career path. And now in yearly assessments, we actually don't ask, so what did you do to contribute to your departmental objectives or your faculty objectives or the university objectives? So we want to make that a concrete part of the assessments that it's also valuable to be a team player because there are so many tasks that require our staff also to have that team spirit, but it's often the same people that come forward. And it's often the same people that have these notions of academic citizenship, where you also engage to larger objectives. And we want to recognize that and to make sure that it's also distributed in a more equal way than we currently see. And it's also a way not only to recognize and reward like, like the, the, the god or goddess of science, the ones that get the, the big rewards, the big uh, grants. Often you see that those people get all the attention, which is good because they are great, they're top scientists, but there are so many people behind them working to make that possible. So how do we recognize and reward also their contributions uh, to the team? So we've called that team science, but it's not only focusing on the way that you uh, contribute in a lab or in a big consortia in research. No, it's also the way that you contribute to your department with regard to teaching management uh, tasks or whatever you need to do as a department to reach the different results uh, that you have set for yourself. So team science is more than only focusing on research. Next, please. The third uh, element that we have put in our position paper is that we want to see a better balance in our assessment criteria between quantitative assessments and looking at the quality of work. And many of our universities have already signed the DORA principles, where that is also very much uh, underlined. And I think there we see in particular in the research domain that in various disciplines, the quantitative assessment is core. And we are now looking at ways to have a better balance there. And the universities are working hard to see what other assessments, frames, and criteria can be used in order to also look at the quality of the work. And also the funding organizations work very hard to contribute there because if the funding organizations ask in the different proposals, so please list the number of publications, your H-index, 
then of course we as academic will do that. But the funding organizations will also require other elements in order to assess your CV, then we will also change our behavior. That's also why it's so important that we do this together with, in this case, the Dutch funding organizations. Next, please. I mentioned already that the value of academic leadership is, according to our program, absolutely crucial and that we should pay much more attention to that. I, in particular, believe that the whole HR uh, development within our sector is neglected and that we should have more, more, many, much more attention to this very important aspect. We see uh, quite frustrating academics that had to work under leadership that was just not functioning, that was not effective, but that no one uh, took the responsibility to change it. And if we want to reach the objectives that we have as universities, then each and every academic staff member deserves to have a good leader. And that is why we have put this so prominently in our position paper. Next, please. And then I come to the topic of our, uh, of our seminar today. Open science is also mentioned in the position paper as a very important step in, our, uh, in the development of our academic ecosystem. And if we want to stimulate open science behavior with our academics, we should also assess the achievements that our academics put in this regard, because this is not something that is just on top of everything else that we do. It takes time. It takes time, it takes development, and those academics that are currently already quite a forerunner in that, should also be recognized and stimulated, and that should also spread to larger parts of our academic community. So I think it's very important that also the Dutch uh, universities put open science and assessing this in the yearly assessments of our academics in order to build careers is crucial. Next uh, step, please. So how are we going to do that? Now, I don't have to tell this distinguished audience who is knowledgeable in open science what the different aspects are and there, i use this tree always as an as an example to see uh, in what way open science can be stimulated for me it's also not only research so you see citizen science fair data it's also about sharing educational resources and in particular in this COVID area it is, has been so important that the universities have shared what they have developed in order to be able to provide online education we, in the Netherlands, we have a university which is called the Open University that is, that is like the key player in digital education and they've taught us so much in the transition uh, to where we are now and that is very crucial as well. So it's not only research, it's also uh, sharing our educational research resources. Next, please. So what is important in this particular aspect relating to open science activities is that um, when we select, so already at the beginning of a career track, when we supervise and when we evaluate, that we also look at the achievements in open science. Uh, and I think that that is something that we're not doing yet. Uh, so this is for the Dutch uh, universities something that we need to put more emphasis on and we should build that in our career assessment tools. And that's also an ambition that we have now openly stated that we, that we will do that. And it's also during the evaluation of research proposal and during the assessments of our research achievements. We have what we call in the Netherlands, the strategy evaluation protocol. It's a research evaluation protocol through which we assess larger research groups within universities. And one of the uh, aspects that we also assess is how these research groups have developed uh, towards an open science culture. And I think that is very important and also, again, to see changes in behavior of academic groups. Uh, next, please. Now, in the Netherlands, we also have the national program Open Science, and they have also put um, recommendations uh, to the universities and to the larger knowledge infrastructure that um, we should include 
both realized and expected contributions to open science as a selection criteria when we hire new researchers and support staff. Also for support staff, I think it's very important because many times it's the data science scientist that helps and supports the academic. Uh, and then I mean the technical data science, these people are becoming more and more crucial and should also be uh, added much more to our academic staff in order to reach these uh, these objectives and these ambitions. We've also said that we want to incorporate open science into policies on the development, support, rewarding and appreciation of scientific staff. And that's what the national program has recommended and we, we took that as an uh, important recommendation. And also ensure that assessment of research proposals incorporates positive rewarding of a researcher or research group, open science track records. And that we also should train reviewers accordingly, which is, I think, also a very important aspect because the reviewers of all these larger research proposals should also know what to look for and also being uh, thought that that is an important aspect that they should take into account. So also the funding organizations are setting up training programs with this objective in their mind. And next, please. I'm still in time, I have to also be my own timekeeper today, which is always a risk for the chair, but you can mute me at some point. That's that. Yeah, perfectly thing. in time. Perfectly yeah, I time. think so. Eh? <laughs> Very good, thank you. <laughs> so what is the secret? Oh, I think I need to go to one, one more back, please. Sorry. Um, so we have till 10, um, uh, uh, around 10 o'clock uh, in Portuguese time, so I, I suppose it's uh, 11. Um, okay. So you still have um, 15 minutes, I would say. Oh, great. But, okay, again, next to the next. Sorry, I, I'm missing one uh, on the screen that I have here in my uh, outlet, but that's okay. I just wanted to mention that the new strategy evaluation protocol that we have uh, developed also has clearly underlines the need for strategic goals for a research unit to include open science and also recognize and reward the achievements there. So every unit that gets assessed by an external uh, review panel, that's the way that we work every five years, they come to visit, that open science is part of that protocol. So in the coming five years, all Dutch universities and the research groups know that they will be assessed on their achievements in the whole open science uh, uh, context. So I think that is really very important. So we are also preparing all our staff and our researchers that that is something that they have to take very seriously. And um, so this I think is, is, is key. Otherwise you don't really change behavior. That's at least the experience that, that I have. So then the secrets of the Dutch approach and again, understand that what we have now is a position paper adopted and I will explain to you in a minute how we are going to implement that because this requires a cultural change. This is not just 14 rectors having a position paper and saying to all academics, now this is the way that we're all gonna assess our staff. Now everyone working in universities know that it doesn't work like that. It requires a lot of dialogue, a lot of consultation sessions, listening to concerns. Some of the concerns relate to what does this do to our competitiveness if I want to move to another country and now I'm assessed in different ways. Will that become more difficult for me? And that's also why we value so much these discussions with our European colleagues to see if we can make this a European approach so that this fear for the younger generations that very much feel inspired by what we're doing, but they're also a little bit concerned that it will hamper their career developments if they move outside the Netherlands. And that's something we have to take serious, I would say. So the Dutch approach, maybe to the next one. So the Dutch context, as I've said already, um, I think it, it's, there are various aspects that we should take into account in order to explain why it was possible to get to this position paper with this whole knowledge infrastructure. And you should understand that uh, when we started working on this two years ago, and I am uh, leading this together with the rector of the Technical University in Eindhoven, and with our program manager, Kim Huyven, who's also in the webinar today, 
when we started two years ago, we said, oh, this will be so difficult to get 14 universities and the Dutch funding organizations and the Royal Academy behind this position paper. We, we were, of course, we were positive and we, it, it was for me uh, a personal driver to become rector in the first place. So we were very committed, but we also feared a little bit that it would be difficult to get all these groups behind us. But it worked. And why is that? Because we first of all already had a very ambitious open science, open science agenda that we were working on. We had the science in transition movement. You saw in the movie a Professor Frank Niedema, who is a big driver behind this movement that has been pushing and pushing and talking and stressing the importance of open science. And as I said, we have really major concerns over work pressure and pressure also on the system, on the system where Many of us write proposals for research grants and the success rate is becoming so low. So there is pressure in the system. So we need to do something in order to, to, to leverage and to, 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 to be able to look at the different talents of our staff instead of pushing everyone in that research domain, whereas we do so much more that is just as important. And that can also relate to the talents that we have within our institutions. And I think in particular, the career tracks with emphasis on education, and we've seen already quite some good examples within the Dutch universities where there are already career tracks and we're building on the work of a British colleague who's called Ruth Graham. And she has developed a very interesting career assessment model in order to decide. So what, does, what do you need to do in order to become professor in this career track? while still doing research, but it's not your, your top core domain. And you can Google her framework uh, very easily. It, it, I, I found it very inspirational. And this was already happening in our university. So all this together made it possible for us to come to this quite bold statement, I must say. Next, please. So, um, in November, to, to, to recap, November 2018, we had the statement, uh, recognition and reward of academics. And then in April, the Royal Academy, that is called the KNAW, the Dutch National Research Organization and the funding organization for medical science, you see the Dutch uh, letters in the abbreviations, they signed the DORA principles and the VZNU, the Dutch Association of Universities already did, and also the individual university did. Um, then in May 2019, we had a big conference, which was called Scientist 2030, Evolution or Revolution. There were, I think, 600 young academics in the audience, and it was amazing what happened there. So we presented our position paper and got so much, so much support that also from that moment on, the movement uh, became uh, uh, yeah, larger and, uh, and stronger resulting also in the end to the uh, position paper that I mentioned that we gave to our Minister of Education, who is now also, by the way, very much committed to bring this position paper on her European uh, tables when she meets with the other national ministers of education. I think that's very important because as I said, we should try to do, if you are seeing any, anything in, in these ideas, then it would be nice to, uh, to work on this together. And as I mentioned, in March 2020, we, had the, uh, we have adopted the new strategy evaluation protocol, which includes also the open science part, but also the, uh, the balance between, uh, or not even the balance, it's, it's looking at the qualitative assessment of the research objectives and not quantitative anymore. So there's no counting. And there's also no uh, numerical assessment like you have uh, five and you have a one. So it's very much a qualitative research tool now to assess the Dutch research achievements. Now, this is all very nice and the rectors among us will think, yeah, very nice, you have a policy paper and then the faculties do what they do and they always do. Yes, of course we know that. So we had, of course, a plan. How do we want to achieve this change? Next slide, please. And then the next, please. So, of course, we understand that the desired cultural change is a fundamental change of beliefs. It's not just a change in the rules of the game, 
So what we need is indeed a broad dialogue within our academic communities. We are sharing good practices. We are experimenting also within smaller groups to see if we look at the, re if we look at the academic unit, so not only research, and then assess through the lens of this position paper, what changes them, what kind of careers are changing, and what does that do also financially? That's also an important indicator. And of course, we are uh, bringing all these practices from the Dutch universities together in the end, resulting into a joint national framework that will provide concrete uh, criteria for the universities to use when they assess the achievements of their staff. And again, investing in leadership is the basis of the intended change. And also here, our HR uh, departments have a crucial uh, role to play in also facilitating this. Now I'm almost um, at the end. The last one, please. Oh, the next one, please. Um, what have we done with regard to the institutional level? We have a what we call a national committee where the uh, heads of the unit, so that means uh, the, 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 the key administrators of the funding organization of the Royal Academy, uh, me and the rector of the Technical University and the president of the Dutch Association of Universities meet to continuously discuss progress in, with regard to the implementation and also to steer the process to develop this nationwide framework. And the funders in particular are currently creating funder funding instruments for a more diverse group of researchers and also training the assessment committees. Now with regard to Ma Maastricht, and that's the next place, um, we have decided at this national uh, high level group that all the 14 universities have to install a committee in the university that gets the responsibility to implement the ambitions in the position paper. And in Maastricht, I am chairing that committee together with my six deans, because the deans also said we are very supportive of this change, so we also want to lead it in our faculties. And the deans lead four committees, one on education, research, impact, and leadership, that are currently uh, actually drafting both the narratives of the change that we want to move to, but also the concrete underlying criteria. And in the end, it's the institutional committee that I'm chairing that needs to uh, foresee the synergies between these different domains. So how do we get to a concrete uh, assessment tool where the underlying dependencies between these four domains and also patient care, which is not mentioned here because patient care is actually in all these committees, it should be further elaborated how we get to those synergies. It's a very complex process. I will not uh, lie about that because we are uh, actually yesterday I got all the output of the four groups, which was very inspirational, but also gave us many more uh, uh, topics to, to, think, to think about. Uh, next, please. So what will all these 14 universities do? They will, before the summer, and the summer in the Netherlands, you never know when it starts, but let's say before the end of July, uh, all the committees, the 14 Dutch universities have developed their vision on the position papers implementation process and translate this also into a narrative that fits also the identity of that university because we also want to have some couleur locale eh, in order to also be uh, better supported at the local level um, and we will of course also share what we do within our Maastricht context at the national level where hopefully uh, in the end of this um, academic year, we will be able to, uh, to come with, uh, with an international um, yeah, overarching framework and concrete tool to be used by the Dutch universities. Okay, then uh, the last, I still have two minutes, I think. Yes, that, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, with regard, to, I thought it would be nice to share also what we are doing in this COVID period because I think it will be the same for your uh, PhDs and postdocs. For those that have to uh, do field work or have uh, research in labs or with uh, on humans, that research has stopped. 
And that means that we, that, that we saw a lot of delays in the progress of our PhDs and our postdocs. So what have we done in the last few months together with the 14 rectors? We've adjusted the quantitative standard for number of articles. We've also discussed the adjustment of, for instance, expectations in order to, to, to already get to this transition that we don't only count, but that we look at the quality of what our PhDs are doing. And that if in the case of COVID, certain aspects, certain objectives cannot be reached anymore, how can we then make sure that our PhDs and postdocs will bring it to the end of their, uh, their trajectory um, by focusing more on the qualitative aspect. So is it so hard, is it so difficult if we have one less study or one less experiment? If you look at the whole four years that they've been working, we think it's not. So we've already used the ambitions in the position paper in this very uh, difficult COVID period. And what we've also seen, and that's the next slide please, is that we are sharing much more than we did before. And I'm very much inspired by this whole idea of solidarity and not sitting on your data and sitting on your material because you want to be the first to score with it. No, we are, we see that widely, European and globally. And I think we should also keep that spirit. And, and because in the end, what we want is to have results with our academic output instead of waiting till the peer review is finished or till you have more and more and more articles and then you know this is something that we see now in with regard to trying to address the consequences of uh, of, of covid or trying to reach the uh, the level of the vaccination we see so much cooperation and that is i think a very important lesson from this whole terrible period uh, that we are in and we should also recognize and reward our staff for the fact that they're doing that and keep this momentum for the future. Now, really my last slide. So again, I am very pleased that I had the opportunity here today to discuss our ambitions within the Dutch context. And I would really hope that we can make this a European transition to change the academic environment, to build careers for our staff that relate to their talents. To do that together is important because international career steps are crucial for science and that's what has always been the case. So we need to work also together on this. We would like to together influence European policies and funding strategies, the way that the publishers work, which is crucial in this the way the rankings work, it can be a totally different seminar, and learn also by sharing best practices. Now, I want to thank you all for listening, and on my last slide you will find our contact details, both from myself and from Kim, who is the National Program Manager. We are happy to share any documents that we have, that we are drafting, in order to, to share. I would also like to thank the organization for a very professional preparation already from the start of the invitation till the rehearsal Monday and, and this morning. I, I very much enjoyed it. I do hope I get invited once to a live uh, seminar, uh, but we'll see when that will be possible again. I hope you also will have some time to enjoy the summer and that you also stay in, in good health. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Ryan. So the time management was top notch. So thank you so much. And um, we have uh, one question in the Q&A panel. Uh, it's coming from um, uh, Santiago Garcia Grande, which is Rector of University of Oviedo. So thank you, uh, uh, um, Professor Santiago Garcia Grande, for the question. And the question is, is this approach mandatory for all Dutch universities? And are there some practical effects on the academic career? Thank you and congratulations for the inspiring talk. So, Professor? Thank you very much. Uh, yes, this is mandatory, but again, you all know that uh, that, uh, that doesn't help eh, if I say this is mandatory. It doesn't mean that the professor who's leading a unit will automatically assess his or her staff in the way that we are now envisioning. So we need to work on that. So we need to work in order to see that we get the entire academic community behind this. But the 14 executive boards and the deans of the faculties 
have said, we, this is the process that we're in, and this is the way that we want to move. So I think that is important. But of course, there, is, there are staff members that find it hard, that say, for instance, that tell me, yes, Rihanna, I don't see why you want to change this, because I had to go through this system this way, so why should someone else not go through the system this way? Which I think is a lousy argument, because it's actually a reason why you, you want to change it. But we also see very positive examples of already units that are looking at their staff as a team, knowing what they need to do in order to reach the best objectives for their team and building careers in these different domains. So we see already very positive changes. And in the end, what would be important is that in this national frame that we are creating, that it also becomes uh, a legal entitlement for staff to make these careers. And it's also part of our collective labor agreements because it should not be a voluntary uh, uh, development where it depends on your uh, manager or leader if you can have the rewards of this transition. No, it should become much more strong. But that is that will take some years. I'll, I'm, I'm almost there as well. Okay, thank you. So we have a request from uh, Professor Rui Vieira de Castro, which is um, Rector of uh, University of Minho in Portugal. I think he, he can um, talk directly with us. So Rui, maybe you can try to put your question directly here. Okay, I'll try. Thank you. Actually, it was, it's not possible for me to put the question on, on the Q&A uh, section. But uh, Professor Vieira, thank you. Thank you very much for your very informative and uh, inspiring uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I'd like to, to ask you if it's, if it's possible to elaborate a little bit uh, on the, the main obstacles that uh, you faced uh, in uh, the development and the implementation of this uh, strategy. And I'm thinking mainly uh, about uh, uh, obstacles within the scientific community. Well, was it the case that, that you faced some, some resistance there? And how, how did you uh, deal with uh, uh, that kind of obstacles. Uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Um, well, there are, there are a few maybe, and maybe not so much obstacles that I'm already experiencing in the implementation because we are still in the, at the first phase of the implementation. But when I am having my dialogue sessions within my own university or with other Dutch universities, and in particular where it doesn't, yeah, with, with sometimes the younger generations, but it can be broader. It's first this whole idea of being, wanting to be um, uh, internationally uh, movable and fearing that it will do something to your competitiveness. So if we will look not only on the quantity of your outputs in the research domain, but we will reward and recognize in a different way. So that will change behavior of our academic staff. Also if the funding organizations change the rules, what will that mean if I want to become an academic in Portugal or in Spain? And then, then they look at my CV, and then my CV has a different color and a different has a different uh, outlook because of our Dutch changes. So people are afraid of their own individual competitiveness. And the second part that is uh, still something we need to very carefully uh, take into account is the fear that qualitative assessments, whether it's in research, education, impact, or the other domains, that it might lead to biases, implicit biases, uh, that uh, will have more damage to our female colleagues. So we are currently also looking at uh, ways to take away these concerns, because people have this idea that quantitative assessments are always objective, which is also not the case, and we can also uh, provide arguments that that's not true, but that is so firmly embedded within our academic culture that that's the way that we assess. So people fear that once it becomes quantitative and that there's a panel looking at your portfolio and your steps in that portfolio, that there is a risk that there's an implicit bias that is damaging to female career steps. And I think that's something we need to take, uh, uh, to take serious. So we're working on, on, on that concern as well. And the other one is um, with regard to uh, some people say, and also the dean sometimes say, yes, but Rihanna, in the, your model, is now everyone going to be full professor on education or on impact or on because what will then the university look like? 
And of course, that's not that's not the way. That's not uh, our ambition that everyone should become full professor. But we want those people that now are neglected, in order or that, that that we are not looking at for career steps. For instance, in this educational innovation domain, that these people become frustrated. So we want to put the light more on those staff members that are so crucial for university tasks, whereby not neglecting the top scientists, that they can still be top scientists. But we want career paths also for the other academics in our, uh, in our university. But there is also this financial concern. How are we going to, and what will then be the balance within the university? And how much high ranked academics will we have? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very excellent. So we have a raised hand from uh, Claudia Rolando, but it, I would ask if she could um, please put the, your uh, question in the Q&A box so we can actually see the, the question. And, um, and while you do that, we have another question in the Q&A, which is from Matt Max Montalvo Martinez. And the question is, um, how much time and effort did it take to reach this unity? Was it difficult to achieve? Well, I, actually, it was not. <laughs> I was surprised because I started being a rector now four years ago. So my second term starts in September. And um, yeah, in, in uh, last year, November, we had the position paper adopted. So we worked on it the two years before. But it really has to do with the context that I sketched, in which the whole pressure on the system and the work pressure experienced by our staff is getting to levels that people are frustrated. And that also executives realize that we need to make a change in order not to lose talents, because that's what we see. We see a brain drain from the universities to other sectors. And if that continues, we will have a problem attracting talents to our uh, institutions. So there is such a need for this transition that we were experiencing very little resistance. Well, thank you. Uh, we have another question from uh, Alec um, Alexandra uh, Teodosio, Alexandra Teodosio, and it says, congratulations to the Rector Rihanna for the Inspire Talk and the strategy proposed, new avenue for evaluation within universities. I think it's the way, and uh, uh, I also open this, will be used to define new, I'm reading, okay, uh, and I'm used to define new methods for evaluating in Portugal. I would like to have some feedback about the interaction with the funding research institutions in your country to define metrics. Yeah, we, we work quite a lot together because what, what at some point they were even a little bit before us in the transition than the university. So they said at some point in the uh, research proposal criteria that academics could no longer uh, list their entire number of publications, which we tend to do, but only five five key publications that you yourself feel are the publications that you contributed most to uh, academic knowledge. And you should, in a narrative, explain that. So it's a narrative way of listing five top publications. So that already is something that changes this idea of putting your hundreds of publications in a CV. And second, for instance, I have a, a, quite a nice uh, research grant from the Dutch organization. And there, every publication that I, uh, that I create should be in an open access journal. Because the funding is from that funding organization, I cannot go to the publishers that are not moving along in this open access transition. So that also changes my behavior because I'm looking only for open access journals now. So they are already quite far um, in trying to influence our individual behavior. And now in this program, we work more and more together to see how we can align what we do in the Dutch universities to what they are doing so that it doesn't count, it doesn't, should not counter, it should not have a counter effect. Thank you. So we have, um, it's almost the final question because we are running out of time. So it's, it comes from Horacio Naveira and it says, how do you plan to train reviewers of the achievements of research groups towards open science goals? Sorry. Well, in the uh, funding organizations, they are uh, training the review panels. Uh, so they have set up a training program. And within my own institution, 
I have a uh, set up that will start in September compulsory uh, courses for all PhDs incoming, but also the ones that are already in the PhD program on open access and open science, so that they also understand what is it, what does it mean for me in my field of research, and how can we guide you towards that transition. So that's what we do individually as a university. Uh, but I, and many universities have such programs. I, I decided to make it compulsory because I saw too many uh, groups that were not offering that. Okay, so the final question comes from uh, Gabriel Arturo Santa Maria Botelho. Uh, and it goes like, um, do you think new digital platforms might be needed slash useful to increase collaboration and cooperation between researchers towards open science, for instance, interactive papers with, with available data and processing algorithms. Yes, absolutely. And not only in the field of research, but also, as I mentioned, in the field of educational resources, because we're all facing the same challenges. Also in the next academic year in having to offer hybrid or blended forms of education. And we're all inventing the same, uh, yeah, we say in Dutch, the same wheel. I'm not sure if that's a Spanish or Portuguese uh, translation, but it's, it's a pity, it's a waste of resources. So we should much more find each other and, and help each other. And that, that's for research sharing and that's for educational sharing. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, Professor Rian, for excellent talk and very inspiring and motivating for everyone, I'm, I'm pretty sure. And thank you everyone also for the excellent questions. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, more time, so we're running a little bit. Well, we are on schedule, so we should try to keep on schedule. And once again, thank you. Uh, thank it was you a so pleasure much. To okay. Thank you all. Eloy, I pass you to you now the, the floor. Thank you, Luis Gustavo. Just to, to let you, you know all that uh, as planned, we will have now a, a short break. Maybe we, we need to, to uh, stretch our legs and uh, have a coffee. So, Unfortunately, we don't have a, a coffee break. Otherwise, we'll have very good uh, uh, Guimarães sweets uh, that are really very good, but caloric bombs. But I hope that you can have your own sweet and a coffee. And we will resume in a little bit more than 10 minutes. So we'll try to, to start at uh, uh, half past 10 in Portugal, 11 past 10 uh, in, um, uh, uh, in Spain, sharp. And uh, thank you very much uh, uh, to Professor Rian uh, for re this really inspiring opening uh, that has really set the tone uh, for for the rest of our of our event. So thank you very much, and uh, we will resume in uh, in uh, uh, at half past ten in twelve minutes. Okay, thank you.